The relationship between the U.S. and Mexico is the story that goes back and forth, flows back and forth across this line for centuries. Se ha estado trabajando el barro negro desde hace 2,500 años. El pueblo que se perdió el traje regional y entonces yo empecé como con la idea de voy a hacer los trajes en barro. A lot of my work deals with borders and immigration. There's a lot of misinformation out there that a lot of these people are criminals coming here, not the people that I know. There is a group of young artists in Tasco that are creating works of art in silver. These pieces are hand wrought and they have spectacular designs. Everything that we do in the workshops is inspired in nature. We try to reinterpret that organic feel to something so stiff as metal. There's a lot of influence from the Mexican culture in my work. But some of us see ourselves as being from both the U.S. and Mexico and maybe not having too many distinctions. The works began to be narrative and they began to tell our stories, ones that had never been told. The art is the most profound of human the arte es el que hermana, aunque no hablemos el idioma, a través del arte nos comunicamos y tenemos el lenguaje universal. Major funding for Craft in America was provided by Cynthia Lovelace Sears and Frank Buxton, Lillian Pearson Lovelace, L.L. Brownrigg, the National Endowment for the Arts, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Stolaroff Foundation. Additional support was provided by the following. I've been in front of artworks and I've had really powerful experiences. It holds me there, it makes me wonder. There's a connection, I think, between works of art through different times. I think they probably come from the same source. There might be a river or something, and this river of creativity is what connects these artworks together. And so if my work could do that, uh, for just one bit, um, for someone, I think I'd be happy with that. My work came out of a question of what are you bringing to the table? What's new to this 10,000 years of ceramic history? A question that was seeking something that was authentic, something that was my own, something that could be new. I started drawing on objects that I made and the objects and the narratives had a direct relationship. It wasn't necessarily to tell a story, but to capture the essence of a story. And so to do that, I, I went back to where I felt most alive. I was born in Oaxaca. I lived there until the age of 10. My friends and I, we all spend our days outside all day, you know, just playing in the street. So in 89, I came here to Los Angeles. I did the same thing here, spending all day outside playing. The neighborhoods were probably not the best neighborhoods to be outside all day. In my teen years, instead of going to summer camp or summer school, we would spend our days in Serrano Street drinking beer, getting into fights, you know. Eventually, you grow up. You see other people making the wrong choices, 
and you decide to make other choices. So I ended up in college, not forgetting where I was coming from. I have a great love for Mexico, and there's a lot of influence from the Mexican culture in my work. But some of us see ourselves as being from both the U.S. and Mexico, and maybe not having too many distinctions. This one's a little stiff, more stiff Is than it? the others. Yeah. Is it? Not that, not that. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I like fighting with my work. It's not all pleasant. It's not all pretty. Sometimes I go in the studio and I'm not happy with what's going on and, you know, I have to fight with my work. My goal is just to keep it alive. But uh, they don't make them like they used to. I knew that I wanted to make a form that had some interesting textures, some interesting movements, because the images are going to be invited by all these structures. I spend time with the form as it's drying I'll start thinking about what images could exist in this form. I don't think I decided, you know, I'm going to become an artist. In my childhood, there was always a creative side of me. And I think I carried that creativity into my teen years through graffiti. So as a kid, in a sense, I, I had an artistic practice, whether you want to call it that or not. My earliest works were influenced by black and white prison drawings and the rich pictorial imagery of the great Mexican muralist. This piece actually started with this little guy, with that little image. I knew that with this form, I wanted to do something that had to do with resilience. And so this coyote, I thought about this coyote, how it can survive, and then other images that has to do with resilience and survival and growth and overcoming and resistance came about. I wanted to live life according to my own sort of, I don't want to say rules, but determinations. So this sense of autonomy, where did it come from? I thought about it more and more. Well, it came from the patriarchy I grew up in, under, uh, headed by my grandfather. In his youth, he was a famous bull rider, fearless, right? He was the sailor of his ship. But with that, I think, also came the ideals of the patriarchy, ideals of masculinity. They were outdated. They didn't make sense in the world that I was living or that I was choosing to live in. You know, some of them have to do with honor, with valor, being fearless. But others are not so positive. I have an image of my uncle looking into the patio where I used to play. He's paralyzed now. He was beaten quite violently and maybe left for death because he was gay. With this piece, I was thinking about those very somewhat violent attitudes that have to do with a masculine identity. As kids, my cousin and I were expected to help people sacrificing a goat. But of course, we couldn't flinch. So they would give us a shot of mezcal to wash away our fear. And so I thought about this attitude of how you suppress certain emotions such as fear. And I think, you know, art is the perfect vehicle to express ideas that maybe you cannot express with words. The creativity I invest in my work, it's similar to the creativity I invest in teaching. I get thirsty when I talk, so I have to keep drinking tequila. <laughs> I mean, water, water. For me, it's not only teaching the material, the techniques of clay, the safety involved, but also it's about opening doors, uh, 
of opportunity, stores of creativity. I mean, who, who isn't fascinated by clay, right? Once you see somebody using this lump of dirt and making something on the wheel is somewhat magical. And I'm going to squeeze and I'm going to follow the clay. I don't think clay has any nationality, right? Because it's a material that has been used for thousands of years by people before there were even nations. And so I think when people learn to work with clay, they access something that it's very human, something where skin color or nationalities or political beliefs or religion or gender has nothing to do with it, yeah? But really, honestly, the most important aspect of ceramics is just to like do things over and over again until it's perfect. Yo desde niño fui muy influenciado ver esos carnavales donde los muchachos salían de los arroyos con una cuerda, vestidos, eh, disfrazados con cachos, con caras de demonio y pintarrajeados y de esqueletos. Y esa, en una imaginación de un niño de cinco o seis años, cautiva muchísimo. De eso viene que yo hago mucho los esqueletos, los diablos, porque es parte de mi cultura, es parte de esa festividad de los pueblos zapotecos. Históricamente, este pueblo de San Bartolo, Coyotepet, se ha estado trabajando el barro negro desde hace 2.500 años. El barro viene de la parte oriente de aquí del pueblo, un paraje que se le llama La Mina. La vamos a traer en costales. Ya que la ponemos a solear y la remojamos, lo sacamos y lo amasamos con las manos cuando es poca cantidad, o si no, con los pies cuando es mucha cantidad. Y ya cuando está totalmente amasada, que ya está listo para trabajar y ya está maleable para poder hacer las piezas. Desde el momento como aprendemos a hablar, empezamos en el taller familiar. Así es como aprendemos, como jugando aprendemos a hacer el bar. Y todos mis hermanos hacíamos un círculo en la casa y empezábamos a trabajar. Mi padre nos decía que hay que darle gracia a la pieza cuando lo está uno haciendo. Que no esté estática, que se vea viva que la gente sienta que está vivo ese trabajo y que se vea en esa manera de que hacemos como si estuvieran en movimiento los animalitos, los personajes. Que salga esa energía como si nosotros fueran. Dice mi papá, si estás enojado, tu pieza sale enojada. Si estás tieso, tu pieza sale tiesa. El taller familiar, esos son uno de los más bellos recuerdos que tengo. Mi hermana Magdalena es muy pulcramente, trabaja las cosas. Sí, una escultora tal con los trajes étnicos que está trabajando. Pasó aquí en el pueblo que se perdió el traje regional del pueblo. Y entonces con eso me surgió la idea de decir, bueno, vamos a rescatar los trajes, a proyectar los trajes. Y entonces yo empecé como con la idea de decir, bueno, vamos a hacer, voy a hacer los trajes en barro porque así pueden, la tela se deteriora, pero el barro se permanece, voy a hacerlo en barro. Ya soy médico, que soy artesana a la vez. Me da satisfacción ser médico, porque es curar el dolor de las personas. Y ser Artesana, pues preservar la costumbre de mi pueblo, los vestidos, los trajes, todas esas tradiciones que hay en Oaxaca y en mi país. Son dos satisfacciones diferentes, pero que a la vez complementan mucho. Entonces le pules este primero, el collar. Y la pulserita. Ajá, y la pulserita para que pueda. La pulserita ya está un poco dura. Vamos a... Ajá. El trabajo lo hago con mi esposo y mi hija, que está aprendiendo ahora, y nos ayuda ahora, ya ella empieza a hacer un poquito más figuras más grandecitas. 
I started playing with clay when, since I was like a year or two years old. Sometimes I help with simple things because I'm just practicing how to do it for the work. In the future, I want to study for being a doctor like my parents, but I may continue with the clay, even if it's not my profession, actually, because it's good to keep the traditions. El barro negro es difícil porque a veces lo bonito, lo llamativo del traje es el color. Y los colores en los trajes, hacerlos en barro negro es difícil para mí. Pero la idea de representarlo lo más posible es como los contrastes en, en los tonos grises, los brillantes, los mates. Mi esposo me ayuda al detallar, pulir, bruñir. Le decimos porque nosotros no usamos esmaltes, colores, pinturas. Y no se le pone ninguna pintura porque en el horno se pierde. El bruñido es para darle los diferentes tonos de brillo a las figuras. Magdalena me enseñó a, a hacer detalles y eh, bruñido de las piezas y su papá me enseñó a hornear las piezas. El bruñido es con una piedra de cuarzo, este, se frota la pieza, se, se bruñen, se le hace textura, se dejan secar unos 7, 8 días y se meten al horno. En el horno se meten, se colocan y se pone a fuego lento durante 7 o 8 horas regularmente para que se puedan coser. Cuando tiene más fuego, se ven las piezas color plata. Y cuando tiene menos fuego, se ven más negras y brillantes. Se deja enfriar un día y de esa manera las limpiamos o las lavamos y ya queda el negro permanente con brillo, listas para exhibición, como se ve. El Museo de Arte Popular Oaxaca tiene una parte muy especial en mi vida, puesto que casi tengo 30 años de estar atrás de ese proyecto. Es una satisfacción bien grande para poder promover el arte genuino de los pueblos originarios de Oaxaca. La Fundación FOFA, que en español es Amigos del Arte Folclórico de Oaxaca. Este programa ha sido muy importante para el desarrollo y mantener vivo el museo. Our mission is to help preserve and promote the folk arts of Oaxaca. We focus on the young artists, 30 and under, to help them develop the ability and the confidence to continue to do their crafts. And we run contests for young artists through this museum. FOFA me ha ayudado bastante. Entre los logros que he obtenido, pues ahorita es este, la beca que me han otorgado para irme a a Francia, Suiza y Alemania. Es un lapso de seis meses de estudio y trabajo. Entonces, para mí es algo muy importante para poder este, dar a conocer mi obra y poder este, llevar todo este conocimiento que tenemos a otros países. Pues yo creo que es importante la relación entre todos los artistas de, del mundo. He conocido a artistas de otras partes del mundo, África, China, etc. Y ellos comparten sus experiencias de cómo los hacen. O sea, es una experiencia cultural, de, de, de relación cultural entre aprende uno y, y ve uno muchas cosas que también quisieras proyectar en, en tu arte o en la artesanía, lo que haces, ¿no? En esa cuestión del arte, es lo más profundo del humano. Y un artista que se relaciona con otro, se están relacionando prácticamente para que haya una convivencia social y cultural importante. El arte es el que hermana, aunque no hablemos el idioma, a través del arte nos comunicamos y tenemos el lenguaje universal.
Coming from a Mexican background, I come from a culture that works with their hands. That's something that gets passed down. It's ingrained in your DNA. When I discovered glass, I realized that I was going to be doing that for the rest of my life. The process of glass is very fascinating. You basically go from a powder to, to a liquid and then to a solid. I'm working on a new body of work right now that's children running or congregating around a piñata, which is normally seen as a celebration. The pieces are referencing refugee children. When refugees are trying to escape persecution or violence, so the idea of when you're a little kid and you're hitting a piñata, you know, you want what's in that piñata. It's hope. I usually work on parts. So I'll make a head, I'll make the arms, I'll make the shirt, I'll make the pants and shoes. And then we attach them hot. If you can imagine having four feet off of a blowpipe, it takes a lot of skill and technical ability. So working with a skilled team is very important. Let me give you a little air, please. Kind of hard. It also requires a very well-equipped glass studio. And Corning is one of the shops in this country where you can go and make something incredible. Flip. We have the capability in the studio here for artists to make big work to really push the boundaries of what they would typically do. Jaime Guerrero's work is definitely very technically challenging. Anytime you bring multiple components together, it's another risk. So now I'm gonna open up the neck and start working in some details, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, a little bit of the ears. To make these pieces, I utilize a lot of different techniques that I've learned over the years. Some of them are acquired from studying with Pino Senoretto, the master Italian artist. There's techniques that Billy Morris uses a little bit where you go inside the bubble and you push out the details from the inside of the bubble. Some of these tools are custom made. So they're tools that are, have like little balls at the end or little shapes to do noses or ears. But I also use your regular kitchen utensils. There's some knives that I found that have really nice shapes on the backs that I could shape little areas of the face with. I use a fork a lot to kind of comb the hair and draw some hair in there. So it's pretty much whatever you need to do to be able to get the effect you want. Corning isn't right around the corner from everywhere, especially from Los Angeles. So it's great when Jaime comes out here to work with us, recognizing the capability of the shop and the team. Being from California, some of the guys were making fun of me because we were supposed to have a blizzard. And I asked, what exactly is a blizzard? <laughs> I'm Mexican-American. I was born here in Boyle Heights, actually. My parents are from Mexico, from a state called Zacatecas. And they come from a long lineage of Mexican charros, which is cowboys, Mexican cowboys. A lot of my work deals with borders and immigration and an attempt to humanize people migrating. There's a lot of misinformation out there that says that a lot of these people are terrorists or that these people are criminals coming here. Um, not the people that I know. The farm worker expresses an immigrant that came to this country to find work, but he becomes criminalized. So in his arms, there are words that say ni aquí ni allá, which means neither here nor there. I feel that these people have come here to find an honest living and to work hard, and they're being looked down upon. It's an important piece for me because my parents were immigrants. They came to this country to work and find a livelihood and create an honest living for themselves. We hear a lot about the Boyle Heights Renaissance, but the creative energy has been here all along. And a lot of the history does involve people with working class sympathies. But the politics was always married, in my mind, to some something creative, either mural painting or community theater or poetry of liberation. 
One of the first sculptures that I saw that Hyman made was a pair of combat boots. And the unspoken truth, very poignant, very moving, was here was a young black or Latino kid from one of these neighborhoods who had been sent or whose only option was to join the military. But this is all that was sent home. This is all the mother in the neighborhood who had lost her son had to remember him by. I don't think I'd ever looked at anything made by hand that moved me as close to tears as those empty, unlaced combat boots made out of glass. And that's an emotional depth that moves Jaime Guerrero's work from craft to, um, to fine art. Yeah. Okay, come out. Keep it turning. Go back to the bench. Just keep it turning. When you sit down, your right hand is off the rail every time. I don't want to see it over here or over here because it's going to be really easy for you to burn yourself from there. Okay? No, keep it. Oh, keep your hand on it. A glass blowing is a very expensive medium to work with, so it's not accessible to everyone. And there's very few people of color working in glass. So I have made it a personal duty to share this resource with underserved communities. Normally these things are not in the plan for us. It's either sports or it's music. That's our only two options where we, where we live. So to have this in my life is like a blessing. It makes me wonder the level where I can push myself to, if I just stick with it. He's saying, well, go ahead and sit down. The lessons of working with class are lessons that are important for youth that have very little resources, like working as a team, working together, and building confidence. These are things that are highly valuable for a 12 to 14-year-old in an underserved community that sees violence every day. Good, that's it. Hold on to the pipe, don't burn yourself. Glass is very mysterious for many people, even though we're surrounded by it in our everyday environment. When you pick up a juice glass to drink your orange juice in the morning, you don't necessarily think about how it was shaped the way it was. With the amphitheater hot shop at the Corning Museum of Glass, we enable our visitors to really appreciate what they're looking at in the gallery because they've seen someone prod, push, shape, pull, mold, do miraculous things with this material that not everybody can handle. It's a lot of pre-planning in my mind how these parts are gonna to go together, because that's very important. So now we're preparing for the shirt to put on the, actually it's a sweater, that we're gonna put on and then head, then hands, then hair. So that's the order. You can't just throw something together, you really have to plan up. The shirt has to slide over the pants and it has to be like perfect size. Okay, torch it. The wrist has to be this big to be able to slide into the sleeve. And when you're working with something this size and with so many different components, door, it becomes super, super complex. So when you connect all the components, the timing of your team and the timing of the heating has to be precise. Open them up, open them up. Open them up. Bob, come around here and open them up. Ah, I got it, I come out, coming out. Yep. Yeah, we're good. Okay. That was a good long flash. Whew. What makes Jaime Guerrero's work unique is the way that he's using sculptural glass to talk about issues of race and identity and politics. And in particular, he is using the fragility and the clarity of glass to talk about things that are often uh, concealed, like the lives of immigrants and other migrants coming over the border. We don't often see them, but in rendering them in glass, he's allowing us to both see and not see them before us. To me, clear glass is the essence of what glass is. It's a glass in its purest form, with no color, with no decoration or any surface texture or anything. It's just, it is what it is. 
And there's something beautiful about that. I think there's something beautiful about having a sculpture almost disappear. You have to look a little harder to see the silhouette. These are works that speak to people on a number of different levels, both emotionally and intellectually. And you know, we're living in a very turbulent time right now. And we are seeing a lot of art being produced as a result of that. Process is very important. The idea is very important, but also putting it into a social context. I think it's important for artists to talk about the things that other people aren't talking about, to address issues that are not being addressed. And really, you know, I think there's a lot to be said. Tasco is a phenomenon. It's an artistic phenomenon. Indigenous people were mining silver here in Tasco before the arrival of the Spaniards. And in the 16th century, Hernán Cortés turned over this region to his two sons. The period right after the revolution is pretty much a quiet time in Tasco. The mines were not as productive and there wasn't a lot of actual silver making in the town itself. William Spratling arrived in 31 and everything changed. William Spratling started his professional life as an architect in New Orleans. He was inspired to come to Mexico to do drawings of colonial buildings and write articles and books on this architectural treasure that was Tasco. He published a book in 31, but the publisher ran out of money, so he made no money. And he was at wit's end about how he was gonna live. And it was suggested to him that he should use the silver, combined with his incredible ability as a draftsman, and design jewelry and hollowware. So he found a couple of goldsmiths and they made very, very simple designs. The success was enormous. By 1938, he had 150 people working for him and he had expanded beyond silver to include furniture, tinware, copper, rugs, and textiles. He chose as his model and inspiration pre-Columbian art. This has had enormous influence in the visual arts of Mexico, and in particular, in Tasco. And it's not like they just make Quetzalcoatl heads. It's they take various motifs and expand upon them. Trabajé durante mucho, que son nueve años casi con Don Guillermo Spratling, los cuales también me sirvieron de mucha experiencia, porque trabajar con el Señor, aunque él no tocaba la herramienta ni la plata, él podía inclusive sacar los diseños y los dibujos muy bien hechos, pero casi le marcaba uno como este croquis, por decir, porque no le gustaba definirlos muy bien. Entonces, eso era un trabajo para la persona que se lo desarrollaba. Eso le servía a la persona que quería desarrollarse, quería superarse, porque si no, yo lo hubiera corrido. Spratling removed himself from the day-to-day -day overseeing of the workshop itself. He was always there, but he turned it over to the maestros. It was the people in the workshop who had control and ownership of what was happening to them on a day-to-day -day basis. The focus on the people who actually did the production of the silver, in a way, brought life to the concepts of the revolution. Trabajé con Don Guillermo desde el 59 al 67 que murió. Y ya posteriormente, al morir 
papel. Pues todos los trabajadores empezamos a poner nuestros talleres por sí mismos. Mi hijo empezó desde los siete años, poco más o menos, ocho. Lo empecé a tener aquí y a sacar cosas más bonitas. Principalmente dentro de lo moderno que se está usando y cosas más voluminosas, más de ornato. Pero sí creo que sí están saliendo nuevos, nuevas generaciones de diseñadores. Se ha estado haciendo nada más que en poco, en pequeñas producciones, vamos, porque también son piezas muy elaboradas, ¿no? Entonces que llevan procesos de dos meses, por ejemplo, las licoreras, esculturas igual, joyería un mes probablemente, o sea, pero sí tratamos de hacer unas buenas piezas, como lo que era antes en la época buena de Tasco. These pieces are hand wrought, they are beautifully executed, and they have spectacular designs. Many of these young designers come with deep roots in the traditions of Tasco. Yo nací aquí en Tasco. Crecí toda mi infancia en, en esta calle en la que estamos, que es Eucaliptos, el barrio de Pedro Martín. Pues yo crecí jugando dentro del taller de platería de mi papá, Ezequiel Tapia. A lo mejor no es bueno que yo lo diga, pero aprendí un poquito de mí. A través del tiempo, ella misma se fue perfeccionando, digamos. Eh, dice el dicho que la alumna supera al maestro. <risa> Jorge. Y en mi caso yo trabajo con artesanos, sobre todo con Jorge Mundo, con el que llevo mucho tiempo trabajando. Catoneado lo hacemos, taladro, ahí le metemos qué alambre. Un alambre grueso, como de unos Ajá. 3 milímetros. Ok. ¿Va? Sí. Ya mucha tecnología para hacerlo, porque te permite repetir muchas piezas, pero nosotros, un poco por gusto, lo seguimos haciendo a la vieja forma. El proceso de la cera perdida es una técnica muy antigua. Entonces, lo que hacemos es tener unas láminas de cera y con las manos y modelando, a veces con ayuda de un poco de calor, vamos dando la forma, algo más o menos como esto, que con los, estos estiques de metal y el calor que se les queda, pues vamos tallando la cera hasta llevarla a esta delgadez. Tenemos que, le llamamos hacer el árbol, ¿no? Entonces lo que hacemos es montar la pieza para soportarlo sobre la base del cubilete. Hay que asegurarlo para que no flote en el investimento. Y aquí adentro vamos a vaciar el investimento. El investimento esperamos que seque bien, 100% seco, si no burbujea y la pieza ya no sale. Este es un vaciado en centrífuga. Esta centrífuga se necesita de un crisol. Sale toda la cera, se funde y automáticamente la centrífuga hace con la fuerza que tiene, hace que entre toda la... y salga así la pieza. Por medio de calor, la cera se pierda. Por eso es cera perdida, ¿no? Se pierde la cera y en el lugar de la cera entra el metal. Todos los diseñadores por aquí hemos sido influenciados por William Spratley. Todo el desarrollo de la platería en Tasco está influenciado por, por él. La historia comienza con mi abuelo, Antonio Castillo, él, de muy joven, trabajó en los talleres de William Spratley, que empezó la firma Los Castillo con sus hermanos en el 54. Posteriormente, mi mamá, Emilia Castillo, pues se enamoró de la platería y empezó su propia marca. Yo, de pequeña, eh, jugando en los talleres aquí, y con las piezas de mi mamá nos empezamos a, a involucrar, a crear piezas, y después eh, conozco a Eduardo, eh, me enamoro de Eduardo 
y eh, viene él a rancho, a, bueno, le decimos rancho, pero son unos talleres, es casa, jardines, aquí es donde, donde vivimos. Después, viendo los talleres, cómo manejan la plata, se fascina con el metal y empieza la, su marca de joyería. Everything that we do in the workshops is inspired in nature. It's based on these organic, wonderful forms that you can find in the sea or in the jungle. And we try to reinterpret that movement and that organic feel to something so stiff as metal. My mother, Emilia Castillo, rediscovered this technique of fusing pure silver directly onto the porcelain. We make the mold, it goes in to be glazed, and then it's taken up to apply the silver. It's very laborious work. There's about 13 or 15 people involved in the process of this piece. Sobre un maniquí, dibujé esta pieza, una maqueta de papel. Posterior a este dibujo, elaboro una serie de planos. Con estos planos, martillamos chapas. Se pegan sobre ella los dibujos, se cortan. Posterior se hace todo el proceso de limpieza, se lima, se pule, demás y posterior se procede con un plano de ensamble. En el caso de esta pieza, es un despiece de más de 200 piezas. Todos los remaches, soldados uno por uno, eh, todo cerrado uno por una. El resultado es el prototipo. Cuando ya tengo resuelto esta pieza y veo que funciona a la perfección, o no a la perfección, pero que funciona bien, procedemos a elaborar el mismo trabajo, pero ahora en plata. No somos plateros ni joyeros, somos diseñadores. Y, por supuesto, eh, hay que agradecer a nuestro equipo de trabajo, porque sí, o sea, aquí están las ideas, aquí, está, aquí están las sinfonías. Necesitamos a, los, a la orquesta y creo que tenemos a la mejor orquesta. Gracias a ellos es que hemos logrado todo esto. Entonces, What Spratling got started evolved into something way beyond anything he could have dreamed of. Tasco became this incredible destination for many intellectuals and artists. My grandparents had the first tourist hotel in Tasco. The Hotel Tasqueño Register shows Rockefellers signed it, people like George Gershwin, Leopold Stokowski, and Mae West. The artist, Howard Cook, painted a mural in the Hotel Tasqueño. He said, would you mind if I paint something here at the hotel? And my grandmother said, sure. And so he painted a mural on the wall of the Tasqueño. When Howard Cook was given the commission to paint the WPA mural in the San Antonio, Texas post office, one of his models is my grandmother. <laughs> Many of those artists who later participated in the WPA murals actually painted murals here in Mexico before going back to paint in the United States. I think it is impossible to overestimate the incredible contribution of the three great mural artists of the 20th century in Mexico, Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and Jose Clemente Orozco. The muralists here in Mexico have created a sindicato or a syndicate, and they only would take workmen's wages. The idea being that they were not some fancy artists, they actually were workers. This concept was not lost on the artists who came down here. George Biddle went back and spoke to Franklin Roosevelt about the idea. And during the Depression, the concept of the WPA was formed to pay some salary to artists in various communities to paint murals. These WPA murals depict the people who live and work in that community. Those murals are now a part of the story of that community.
I went into art school and I was trained in abstract expressionism. It was the 1970s, that's the way people were trained. I learned the gesture as an important mark. I learned about color and op art theories, so I got good color theory. And when I was graduating, it was a big celebration. The family came together and my grandmother, she said to me in Spanish, it's okay, mija, what do you do? So I showed her this portfolio and for the first time I saw it through her eyes. And then I realized it had no meaning, had no meaning to her. I was actually perfectly equipped to speak to nobody I knew. So I actually began to think quite differently about my art. And very quickly, the works began to be narrative. And they began to tell stories that were our stories, ones that had never been told. And they began to be scaled. And they began to take up space. And they began to make powerful statements about a new thought about who we were. She wasn't alive to see the first mural that I did, which was a portrait of her. It was not an exact portrait, but it was a giant band shell in Boyle Heights in Hollenbeck Park, in which her arms are outstretched in a circular band shell space called Mi Abuelita. Don't you think we can go from that white smoke and this almost like sky writing? Right. And then you could be, then you go to snow. Yeah. We are, at this moment, working on two segments of the Great Wall. We have completed all the way from prehistory to the 1950s in a half a mile long mural. We're constructing the history of the 1960s and the 1970s. We're looking at underrepresented events of of an interpretation of a time from the perspective of young people, from the perspective of women, from the perspective of Native Americans, from the perspective of Latinos. Remember, every time you're looking at this thing, it's 10 feet, mm -hmm. and we're looking at three feet below. Mm -hmm. Your viewers are 70 feet across. That guy has a baby in his arms. Yeah. You know, right. they're occupying Alcatraz, and they have their families with them. Starting in 1970 and 71, I was the director of the City of Los Angeles mural program, and the Army Corps of Engineers called me up one day and said, you know, we have just completed our building project. The Army Corps of Engineers had been systematically concreting the rivers of Los Angeles. What they had was a reach of what they called the Tahunga Wash. It was an area that they wanted to create a park along. And so I thought, wow. And I said, here's what I want to do. I want to bring kids from all these different places. I want to create one mural that's a narrative work, and I want it to be on the history of California. Now, mind you, nobody in the arts thought this was art. They thought I was a gang member first, and then they thought I was a gang worker, and then I was a teacher. But none of them basically said, this is actually an artwork that is a conceptual work that has at its nature the transformation economically and culturally and spiritually to people of this community. The first thousand feet of the Great Wall was done all in one summer. I hired 10 artists to work with me, and I gave each artist 100 feet to design and 10 kids to work on each of those crews. It was very difficult for it to have any continuity. So after the first thousand feet, is what I think becomes a real mural. I've gone to the Taller Siqueiros, and I've actually learned about compositional designing into architecture and transformed the way the work has been done. These guys should be here. Well, I think you should make Alcatraz be really large. Okay. And, uh... The lines that surround the images are divided up into golden ratio. The divisions of space are actually based on the Fibonacci sequence. So what it lets us do is create these dynamic relationships across long sections of the mural. What this is representing is 30 linear feet, but the mural that we're actually working with is 360 linear feet. So some of those lines could actually pin down the composition across that entire decade. So we look for really important movements in the drawings, and it also helps us by inspiring something else, another composition maybe. Or it helps us even transition from one particular segment to another. 
I mean, we would have to do hundreds of drawings just to take a look at this. And now we can take a look at it this way and then actually finalize with compositional intent. Okay. So what do you think? Is it good I, print? I like it a lot. I think that's a good start. Let's take it, let's take it to print and let's do some drawing on it. As you go in, you can fill those in. So this would be quinacridone. Perfect. Part of our process has been really an extension of the methodology that Judy came up with in the Great Wall of Los Angeles project, in which we work in relationship to the experiences and historical context of a community. And we incorporate their work and their stories, their oral histories, their ideas, and we elevate them into public artworks our legacy of these works, both in how we're trained as artists and also in how we think of what art could do in community. This is really, in many ways, connected to the tradition of Los Tres Grandes, the Mexican muralist. When I stood on the banks of the river, I began to imagine that if you could disappear the river, how much easier was it to disappear the stories of the people? And as I began to look at history, I had begun to see that we had at our very base uh, a story that had never been told. Ruben gets murdered. And that, in fact, it was systematically disappeared. That image, that image is really important. He's holding that, Nixon. That's got to go right here, somewhere. Where? The last 1,740 feet are the best works. They become more complex. It becomes funnier. I find my sense of humor in the process because the history of race in America is really tough to look at. And I didn't want this really terrible story. I wanted to look at what was the triumphs of people over really adverse circumstances. What was the truth? Tell the truth. But at the same time, see how people transform their lives, regardless of what circumstances they came out of. And that was really the story of the Great Wall. I have an idea. We run a perspective point somewhere, maybe right. here, and going out to these points. Mm -hmm. Well, then maybe we take it and we hit this mark here. That right. will carry us across. Somewhere yeah, like here. Line, oh, up, line up our body. Yep. Yep. Then that's all of a sudden snaps in. These they'll go into renderings and then they'll be refined, and then they'll become blueprints and then they will become colorations, and then they will become what becomes the mural. Long process. <laughs> the, the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico is ongoing. The story that goes back and forth, flows back and forth across this line for, for centuries. We're mutually dependent. And I actually think it's so important for us as artists to visualize for people the connectedness between us. And maybe that's what my work, all of my work has been about. The connectedness between us as peoples, a good place, and that memory resides in the land. All you have to do is learn to hear it, to put your ear to the ground and it comes right up off the ground.